Hello and welcome to the latest edition of Roundtable. Uh, I'm Ian Knight, your host. Uh, I've also got co-host with me, Simon Chamberlain. Simon. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Uh, and tonight we'll be chatting with um, ex-Grand Prix motocrosser, ex-TV, no, it might be current TV uh, commentator, uh, businessman, and now author, Rob Andrews. Hello, Rob. Uh, yeah. Hello, gentlemen. Yeah, nice, nice to be here. Um, hello, that sounded quite a, quite a lot there, didn't it? Um, businessman. It probably is ex-commentator. Actually, I didn't do it last year. Uh, they just cut it down to one commentator, so Jack was or Roger was uh, was on his own. But uh, you never know. We might do it again. We'll see what happens. Good. Now, if I may, we're going to talk about the book, and obviously everybody's sort of interested in the book because of it being seen on every Facebook page known to mankind. Uh, but <laughs> if we could just find a bit about Rob first uh, yeah. and then move on to, to the book, um, it, it'd be quite helpful. I'm sure some of the stuff I chat about will be in the book anyway, so I'm sorry if that repeats. But I, I, I have to admit, and Rob knows this, that I haven't got the book yet. I am going to get one. Um, Simon's got one, but I haven't got one. So I may say things that somebody turns around and tells me, ah, that's already in the book. So I, I excuse that. But one thing I'd like to find out, and it's something I'm finding interesting as I'm talking to some of these older riders. When you first started, I've seen a few things on the internet that you bumped into the imps, the, uh, uh, the display team, the kids display team, and got interested. But how did like a non-dirt biking family go from, I'm interested, I want a bike, in an age with no internet, in an age with no, do you want an electric bike, do you want a petrol bike, do you want a trials bike, do you want a, there was none of that. How did you go from, I um, want one, to, to finding out how to get one when, when you're not involved? It's a good question. Um, as you said, I, I wasn't interested in bikes at all. I became interested in motorcycles just by one day happening upon this schoolboy display team, the Imps. That, that was what gave me my interest in motorcycles, not so much motocross. And even then, when I'd, when I'd seen that display team, I didn't know there was motocross, certainly not for schoolboys. Um, that just sparked an interest in <clears throat> motorcycles. So that led to me um, buying myself a, a field bike, which was a, a Suzuki K10P, I think it was called. Yeah. I knew it was an 80K at the time, which is a little 80cc, Suzuki road bike from the, from the 60s. Uh, I think I probably bought that out of the classified ads of the local newspaper. Yeah. Um, bought that myself in order to just ride around the fields because it was a motorcycle. I still didn't know about motocross then. Um, and then this was a road bike with road tires and I was riding in a farmer's field around the corner, which I didn't have permission for, incidentally. <laughs> just as we feel around the corner, we'll just go and ride around this field. Nobody ever stopped me. Um, but I, I knew that you could get knobbly tyres. Um, and so I went one day to a, a bike shop in Tewkesbury, about seven miles from where I live, to see if I could get a knobbly tyre for, uh, for this bike. Um, and in that shop, there was a, a motocross bike in there. It was a Carabella, of all things. Remember those Mexican bike? It was yeah. in the window. Um, yeah, and I went in and started <laughs> talking to the guy that owned this, this shop, a chap named Ivan Goddard. The shop was called Unibike in Tewkesbury. Got talking to him. Um, I think I was probably looking at this motocross bike. Um, and he said that his son raced a schoolboy motocross. And his son was called Patrick Goddard. Um, and Patrick actually went to my school. I didn't know him. He was in the year below. I think I probably vaguely knew his, his name. But he said, no, my son races motocross. His son wasn't there that day. But he invited me along to go with them the next day to watch Patrick ride, which was at Bisley, the Seven Valley meeting. This would have been, must have been 1976, something like that. Um, and so I went along that day uh, to, to watch Patrick. And so I became friends with the Goddards. It was the Goddard family that introduced me to motocross. Right. So that led me to, to discover that there was schoolboy motocross. I remember coming back from that, that first schoolboy meeting. It was just so exciting. You know, <laughs> that's where I saw all those other bikes. You know, the, the downpipe 125 Honda Elsinores and 
Suzuki RM125, you know, got RM125 written on the seat. I just, that was just the coolest thing in the world for me as a, <laughs> as a 14 year old kid. It's funny the things that stick in your mind. You know, the, the excitement of just seeing those bikes. Well, the first time I saw motocross bikes, and they had high mud guards. Mm. And I was just fascinated by that. You know, I'd never seen a bike with, with a high mud guard before. And so I went to watch that schoolboy race. Um, that made me interested in schoolboy motocross. But, but I didn't come back and say to my parents, <clears throat> can I race schoolboy motocross? I didn't even say, well, you know, if I buy my own bike, can I race? Because how am I going to get there? You know, it, it was a family thing. You know, your, your parents had to take you. I never even thought to ask my parents because as far as I was concerned, there was no way they would ever go along with something like that. There wasn't any point in even asking them. Did they, so, have, any, did they have any interest more to sport in any way? No, or? not at all. Not at all. You know, up to that point, my, my, my dad hadn't really spent that much time with me, I suppose. You know, I ended up having a great relationship with my dad but prior to that point. I don't remember him ever playing football with me much or anything like that, um, which was which was fine. Um, but I just continued to ride this little road bike around the field on, on my own. Sometimes a friend would come along and he'd have a go. On. And I remember slipping off it once, not going very fast, probably all washed out, and I, I fell off it. Um, and I twisted the forks on it. And so from my perspective, I just wrecked my bike, you know, it was, it was damaged. So I had to kind of explain to my parents that I'd fallen off this, this bike. Um, what I subsequently discovered, actually, I bent the forks, so I thought, um, and so I, I cried about this because I, I damaged my bike. I ended up, you know when you twist the forks on a push bike and you yeah. put the leg between your wheels and you pull them back straight again? I yeah. tried that and it went straight back. <laughs> And I discovered it's because there were no pinch bolts in the triple clamps at all. <laughs> <laughs> it was only held on by the, the forks, only held on by the two top bolts that go through the top triple clamps. Yeah. But anyway, I crashed this and my parents, my dad said to me, he must have had a conversation with mum. He took me to one side and he said, you know, you fell off your bike, I'm a bit concerned about this. And I thought, he's going to stop me riding bikes. That was, I was convinced that was what was going to happen. But to my complete shock, he said, if you're going to ride bikes, I think you should do it in an organised environment. In other words, at, at races, at schoolboy races, where there's first aid. And so actually it was his idea for me to start racing motocross. Um, and I just can't believe to this day that that, that actually was how it, how it turned out, that it was his suggestion. Um, but to get back to your original question, how did I know what bike to ride? I suppose because by this point I'd gone to that 1-7 Valley race I got to know Patrick Goddard, and so I'd become interested in motocross, even though I, I didn't ever think I was going to do it. And so I, I knew that there were RM125s and Yamaha YZ125s and that sort of thing. Um, trials and motocross news hadn't started then, but, oh. but motorcycle news covered motocross, so I probably started buying motorcycle news. I think Patrick managed to get hold of copies of Dirt Bike and Motocross Action somehow. So I remember him showing me one of those at school. So I started to get my information from, uh, from there. But my first bike came from Fowler's in Bristol. It was a, a TM125. I think it was a 1973 model. So it was about three or four years old. How I found Fowler's, I don't know. Maybe they would have been advertising in motorcycle news as well. Yeah, they were a big advertiser in motorcycle news back then. Yeah. And I bought it from Bob Hart. So he's probably still around. I'm sure you know Bob Hart, don't you? Do you know that name, Bob Hart? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Used, to, I used to be in the industry, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he was the guy that, that sold it to me. You know, the very first day I went to, to ride a, or to buy a motocross bike, it was Bob Hart there. And I got this TM125 and I got it home and I went to put it into gear and it just stalled. It's because there were, there were big grooves in the clutch basket. The clutch wouldn't disengage. <laughs> just couldn't ride the thing at all. And I remember ringing him back up. I was only 14 and complaining about it. And of course, being a being an adult, he, he just um, crushed me, really. <laughs> I had to get some guy out who, who came and took it apart and filed the grooves off the clutch basket and then we were away. But that's how it started. I, I take it your dad took you down to Fowler's. Did he have any say or help in, 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 in choosing the bike? Ooh, uh, not, in, not in choosing it. I mean, he didn't know anything about motocross. I was starting to learn. 
um, you know, there was no way I was going to, I was going to have to buy this bike myself. I had to work Saturday jobs. You know, he said, right. you can do motocross, but I'm not paying for it, is what he said. He said, I I'll take you to the races, but I worked several Saturday jobs for like a year and saved up probably about 250 pounds. I think this bike was 285 pounds. My dad probably put the, the remaining 35 um, and he'd paid for a trailer and he'd put a tow bar on his car. car. Uh, and, and we started going to the races with, with car and trailer. But the decision as to what bike to to have, he left up, up to me. I think when we were at Fowler, there were two bikes. One was 275, one was 285, and he said, go for the more expensive one. I think it was a, a, a year new or something. Okay. Yeah. And that take it, your dad then got bit with the bug as you were starting to do more of it, and he started to enjoy it too. Yes, he did. He, you know, he said at the beginning, we'll go racing once a month, but we never did that. We went every week. You know, I joined the, the, the Cotswold Club and the Seven Valley Club, um, and it was Lily Hill and Nancy Selwyn, if any of you, the, Nick Selwyn's no. mom that was yeah. running. Um, yeah. I don't know whether they were the secretaries of the, the two clubs or whether they were both working in the, the one, I can't remember, but those are the two names. And it was 1977, and um, the first race was at uh, was at Bisley, the place I'd first gone to to watch. And my dad came along, um, and my mum, you know, and she packed sandwiches, and we had a day out of it. And he started to meet other people, um, and got to make friends in the schoolboy world. And so they started to enjoy it as as well. And those were just the best days, as. Um, you know, Simon, you will have read in the in the book yourself. I, I say those those early schoolboy days were the, the best days of my racing career. I think. Yeah. Uh, so so easy going. I because think the results didn't matter. It, yeah. It, I just couldn't believe that I had a motocross bike with the high mud guard, and it was a Suzuki, <laughs> and I and I was actually I was fourteen, just or just turned fifteen, and I was racing a motorcycle. I just couldn't believe it, and and. I didn't expect to be any good. I didn't expect to, to do well, or win or anything. I was just, I was a kid riding a motorcycle. Not just riding a motorcycle, but, but scrambling, going around a motocross track. And it was just, it didn't matter where I finished. I just couldn't wait for each weekend to come. Results weren't important. And, and it was just the, the most fun I've ever had. Yeah, I yeah. Com completely agree. And, and you lived in a fantastic area as well, didn't you, for there being events all the time around where, where you live. Um, yeah, was, yeah, there, were, there, there was, oh, it's very rare that we didn't race every weekend. We had the Cotswold Club and the Seven Valley Club. My friend Patrick Goddard, he raced with the Seven Valley, so that's the club I joined. And, you know, everybody also joined the Cotswold because they alternated, there was never any clashes. But, you know, the next year, this was 77, 78, I raced more up in the Midlands because it was a little bit easier. And up there, there were loads of clubs, the Wire Forest, the uh, Sandwell Heathens, Orly Wasps. Um, oh, there, there, there were, you know, loads and loads of clubs and loads and loads of tracks. And the tracks were brilliant, particularly around the Cotswold area. Some of those tracks were just fantastic, you know, better than the, some of the tracks we see these days. Yeah. Can, can you remember some of the names of the, the lads you were riding with in, in the early days when you first yeah, started? Yeah, uh, Grand Horsefield. You know, one of my first friends, Grant Horsfield. Um, obviously, his dad was, was Chris. And Chris had a shop just down the road from us at Eversham. Um, yeah. I remember going in to see, in fact, probably before I even started racing, I, I went down to that, that shop at Eversham and met Chris. Um, I remember him offering us a cup of coffee. I've never been to a, any shop before where they offered the customers a cup of coffee. And we sat and talked motorbike. And I had no idea, really up until a few years ago, just how good Chris was. I knew he was a, he was a rider from the past. I didn't realize how good he was until mm -hmm. I saw him being interviewed a few years ago, along with Jeff Smith. And then I realized, wow, he was actually pretty good. I just knew he was Grant's dad. Um, so there was Grant, uh, Grant's um, Mickey Mountjoy. That was another name I remember. And then when I moved up into the into the West Midlands, there was Darren Jeans and he was a Kawasaki sponsored rider, Paul Monkley, Mark Boxley. Uh, gosh, this is going back forty years now. Um, <laughs> you know, and there were some good guys in the in the other group. Now Mark Faraday, you, know, you spoke to Mark quite yeah. recently, and, and Jason Bonham, they were in the seniors. I was in the experts by 
by this point. Mm -hmm. But in the Seven Valley Club, there were some great riders there. You know, you look at some of the old results. I still got the results from my first, or I got the program from the first ever race I did. And you see the names in there, you know, and there's, there's Mervyn Anstey and his brother John Anstey Thorpe is in there, obviously. Um, Andy Nichols, uh, Kelvin Tatum. You know, a whole load of good riders. And the Sem Valley Club seemed to attract the better riders and all the fast guys went there, which is why I cleared off up into the Midlands the next year. Because <laughs> I might have a chance of winning the trophy. Yeah. We, we, from Lancashire, we travelled down and probably the, the most regular races we did were kind of the West Midlands, uh, you know, down to Wire Forest and what have you. Um, but yeah, Wire Forest, that was, yeah, that's the other club, yeah, Wire Forest. It was quite a, a but the the area there was two things. Um, being from Lancashire, we were excellent at mud racing, uh, but we travelled down and we had to get used to dust. We only saw dust for about two weeks a year. We didn't uh, we didn't have to work to work up because it's grim up north, you know. It's uh, <laughs> it's not too uh, not too there. Um, now Simon, I know you had a a, a little question about. Uh, 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 about his influence, shall we say? Yeah, um, I think I might know the answer to it, but it, for, the, for, the, for the benefit of everybody else, who was the most influential person in your motocross career, excluding your family? Excluding my family? I was going to say my dad, um, but I can't I, say my dad. I said no, that. My dad was an influence, not because he was yeah. into motorsport, but you know, for, for, for other reasons. Most influential person? Uh, then that's going to be Brian Wade, yeah. which is probably the answer that you're expecting. Me. Yeah, but I mean, not, not everybody's read, read, read the book or halfway no. through it like no. I am. So yeah, just just explain a little bit more why Brian was so... I started quite late. I mean, I was, it was a couple of weeks before my 15th birthday. So I raced 77, 78, 79 in the school boards. And I went through as long as I could in school boards. I was at 17 when I was still racing school boards. Um, never had any tuition. Um, I started to get a little bit better, you know, in the schoolboy championships in 79, I finished fifth in the BSMA championships. That was a several round championship. And at the, the two day British championship thing, I was, I'm at 14th, but, um, I was probably a little bit better than 14th, but you know, I was become a decent schoolboy. So my dad booked me into a Brian Wade training camp at Hawkstone. Um, and I was so excited to go to this for a couple of reasons. I'd never ridden Hawkstone. Um, I'd never met any motocross superstars. And Brian Wade at that point was a motocross superstar. He just retired, but you know, he was a five-time British champion. So I was looking forward to meeting him um, and getting some tuition. So I did this Brian Wade training camp. As a lot of people watching this would have done, we had to run up the hills and, and so on. But um, I listened to him. Um, I'd never seen anybody ride as fast as him when I saw the, the demonstrations. You know, he, he, he took us to the first corner. This was on the practice track at Hawkstone. So the first corner is just sort of in front of the famous Hawkstone double jump, but off to the side on the infield. Uh, and he walked us through it and how he was going to do it. And then he came along on his Honda Twin Shock 1979 Honda Red Rocket. He came down the hill from the sand pit, wheeling over these bumps. And I just, I'd never seen anybody go so fast into a corner and then through it. You know, his handlebars are almost dragging on the ground. And this, this momentum that he took out of it, he really used that corner to, to gain speed down the next grade. My jaw just hit the ground when I saw that. But mm -hmm. I listened to what he t said and, and everything he explained about how to ride a bike just made sense to me. You know, so I was... I was 17 then, um, and he just explained it in such a logical way. Like, for example, when you're braking into a corner, you stand up with your weight over the back, because all the weight gets transferred forward when, transferred forward when you brake. And so all the weight goes onto the front wheel, the back wheel becomes light. So you stand up with your weight over the back to put more weight on the back wheel to give it traction. It's so obvious when someone explains it like that. But nobody had ever told me that. Um, and I've never seen anybody explain it like Brian explains it even to this day about how, how to ride. And so I thought, yeah, that's oh, why, is, why have I never thought about that? I remember, you know, stalling, going into the corners because the back wheel was locking up. So 
I listened to his techniques and I put them into practice and I just did the two days. Um, and I think I got a bit faster. And then afterwards, I was packing up and he asked to see my dad. He, he said, can you come and talk to me? This was up in the Marshall's hut at Hawkstone, up by the woods there. And so I started loading up and my dad went off and he, he was there for an hour. And I thought, I had no idea what they were going to talk about. Um, I thought I must have been in trouble for something. And eventually my dad came back and he said, you're not going to believe this, but Brian's putting a team together with Honda support next year, um, schoolboy team, and he wants to bring you on board as an adult rider. So just like that, out of the blue, I was a fully sponsored, you know, bike parts mechanic. He'd take the bikes to the races. This is a 17-year-old. I, I just couldn't believe it. And, and I... And then probably the best bit for me was that I was then able to go to as many Brian Wade training camps as I wanted to. So I just kept going to these training camps and then he started to get me doing the riding tuition as well, the demonstrations. And, um, and then we built up to sometimes he, he would just let me take the riders off and I'd tell them how to do it. And so that was the start of my relationship with, with Brian. And so he really taught me how to ride. You know, if I, do any riding tuition with anybody these days, which I don't do very often. All I'm doing is repeating Brian's techniques. Yeah, Brian's yeah. techniques are, are as valid today as they were 40 years ago. You know, j jumping may have changed a little bit, but the, the basic physics of cornering, the bikes don't care that it's 2020, not 1980. Yeah. Physics doesn't care. You know, so, so the mechanics of, of, and the physics of how you should ride a bike is exactly the same today as it's always been. And Brian Wade's, Wade's techniques are, are still absolutely valid. I used to be a Brian Wade fan, and my first helmet was white with the black stripes like Brian's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was famous for that. And it, was, it was an easy paint job to do, wasn't it? Yeah. With the installation. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I've, I've been messaging him recently about, uh, 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 and hopefully we can get it sorted. He, he's, he's up for doing one of these. Uh, one of these chats, uh, and he's a character, isn't he? He's he really... is. I, I lost touch with Brian for a long, long time, and then managed to, you know, when the internet came along, managed to find him in Borneo, of all places. But yeah. he's a really good friend of mine. Um, you know, he, him and his, his sidekick, Jim, they were a funny couple of guys. They were a great double act. Um, I used to go down and do physical training with them down at Stroud on a Tuesday night. And they'd have me in stitches. They just bounce off each other, and um, you know. And they they were. I would have been seventeen, eighteen at the time, and and Wavy would have been thirty two, thirty three. And he always had these beautiful looking women after him, and and he drank wine, not beer, and he, he strutted around in fancy cowboy boots. He was just cool. <laughs> the two of them were just cool. <laughs> in fact, let me. We're going off subject here, but let me tell you this. So his mate. Jim was the ex paratrooper, and they used to strut around in these cowboy boots. And I was an impressionable 18 year old, and they were those things were just cool. But I thought, I've got to get me a pair of these. I said, Where do you get these uh, these cowboy boots from, and Jim? And he said, Oh, I've, I've got, got a load at home. He said, I, I sell them. So I went up to uh, Jim's place, and he opened up this shed, and he got boxes and boxes of these cowboy boots, and he said, they probably fallen off a lorry, I would think. <laughs> and so he said, what size are you? And I said, nine. He said, okay. And he's, he's pulling all these boxes out. And he hands me a pair of sevens. <laughs> and I said, no, no, it's nine. And he said, no, the thing is, he said, they stretch. He said, trust me, they stretch. You've got to have them really tight because they'll, they'll go baggy. Uh, and I went, oh, okay, Jim. So I bought these sevens and I couldn't get them on my feet. And I even bought some shoe expanders. I ran <laughs> these shoe expanders in there to try and stretch and they never did stretch. And it was only, you know, decades later that the penny dropped. And I thought, these things were, they fell off the back of the lorry. He didn't have nines and he stitched me up because all the other sevens. <laughs> and they were 40 quid. I remember that. <laughs> that was a lot of Never wore them. I could get my feet in <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Uh, carry on, Simon, with your stuff. <laughs> that was a brilliant story. <laughs> uh, yeah. Just another one here. You've commented online about modern track design recently, which I think we all sort of probably agree. Have you uh, had any backlash? And would you offer your opinion on tracks now if you're asked? Backlash? 
no backlash whatsoever. Um, I sometimes wonder whether anybody even reads my stuff. Um, no, no we don't. On, on Facebook, you know, if I ever post something about my views on, on tracks, uh, I always get a lot of people responding, but, but nobody from the industry or, or a club or a track has ever got in touch with me. Um, I think that, I don't like the way modern tracks have, have gone. Uh, my primary gripe with them, you know, I accept the fact that it's not 40 years ago. You know, bikes are better these days. And, and I'm not saying get rid of jumps, but my biggest gripe is that, that there isn't, the racing isn't good enough. There isn't mm. overtaking. You know, the, the most memorable races that we've ever seen are ones where there's been a big battle, where there's been overtaking going on. Thorpe last to first at Bali. Um, yeah. You know, the, uh, Johnson Bailey 86 at, at Anaheim Supercross. It's when there's overtaking. You don't yeah. remember a track because there's big jumps. No. Um, and so to me, if I was in charge, I'd say, okay, let's, let, the primary objective here, the primary goal should be to, to get overtaking, to get passing. That's what we want to see. We want to see battle backwards and forwards. That's what gets people on the edge of their seats, hanging over the fence, mm. uh, shouting. And the, the track designs are not conducive to that. No. And that's because I don't think anybody gives any thought whatsoever to creating the shape of the corners to, to make passing opportunities. I know that doesn't happen at GPs because I've actually spoken to them. I've actually met with Luongo at Matterley a few years ago to discuss this very subject. And he put me in touch with... Oh, yeah, he put me in touch with his, his, one of his sidekicks, a guy called Nicholas Gumaris, uh, and we walked around the track at Matterley, and he's in charge of the tracks. And I said, who, who designs the shape of the tracks? And he said, oh, well, the track builders, Johnny Douglas Hamilton and Greg Atkins. I said, no, if, they build the jumps. They bulldoze it, and they build very nice jumps. But in terms of the shape of the corners and the actual layout, who does that? And he said, well, that's me. And I said, and, and what's your riding history? And he said, I, I used to ride enduro bike a bit. And that was it. So I think that when they lay those tracks out, the, the, the actual shape of the track, they, someone just goes, oh, well, let's go up there and then we'll go down there and then maybe we'll have a corner. And that's the extent of it. Mm -hmm. And I'm of the belief that you can design the, sh the, the shape of corners so that you can guarantee passing opportunities. You've got to make it where the fastest line leaves you open to a block pass. Mm. So if you don't protect the inside, someone's going to block pass you. But if you do protect the inside, the guy behind you can take the faster line, which is outside inside, yeah. and create passes. So you, yeah, you'll always get, if Jeffrey Hurlings gets the whole shot, he's, he's going to be gone. You know, you, you, yeah. you can't do anything about that. But so many times you hear riders saying, ah, oh, the track was difficult to pass on. Why? Yeah. Why are they still saying that? It's 2020. Surely there's people that know enough about the sport to, to create tracks where it isn't difficult to pass. Yeah. Mm. Just down to the shape of the corner. And I spoke to people about Matterly. You could just, some of those corners, you can just move a stake and you create a passing opportunity. Um, but they don't think about it. Yeah. Uh, and then, quite interestingly, uh, a couple of years ago at the Augstone International, Joel Smets was there with um, Paul Jonas. Yeah. And, uh, he, he actually sort of got up and said, you've sport the best track in the world by putting all the jumps on it. Yeah. Yeah, so. but those jumps, there's too many. It's not that I don't like jumps. It's just those jumps at Hawkstone, what's the point of them? What are they for? All those jumps in the infill, what are they for? Well, all they're doing is, is killing any momentum coming out of corners. All wow. those loops in the centre, you, know, you used to be able to get a good drive and, you, and you've got room down the next straight then to, to, to turn that little bit of extra speed that you've got in the corner into an overtaking loop. But you can't now because it's a jump. And it's wow. not a big jump. It's, it, it, I just don't understand it. I really don't understand it. It's as if they, somebody just thinks, oh, a jump's are exciting. So if we put 25 jumps in, it'll be 25 times more exciting. Mm -hmm. But it isn't. Hawkstone has been ruined. You know, the, the, those whoops over the back used to be mega. 1982, when they were long rolling whoops and, and Neil Hudson and Van der Ven were just clipping the tops of them. Yeah. It was 
fantastic there. I would go and I would stand and watch that all day. And now look at them. Mm. Why, why, why hasn't somebody actually thought about it and thought, oh, actually, these are crap? Mm -hmm. The sandpit used to be much better when it was just a vertical drop down yeah. into it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I think Hawkstone's been ruined. But you know, going back into the into the eighties, I wrote to the Hawkstone Salad Club with some suggestions then about what they could do to the track. Uh, and I never received a reply. And what I heard on the grapevine was that they just thought I was trying to turn it into a road race track. Um, yeah. mm. And I think, you know, I'd be quite happy to go up to Hawkstone and give them my advice. But nobody seems interested. Luongo wasn't interested. I mean, it's a pity because it's got such its history, hasn't it? I've been going since late sixties, believe it or not, uh, to Hawkstone. I've I've been at it for quite a long while. Uh, not me racing in the late sixties, but um, and it ha always had its own feel. It always had um, the Hawkstone. So even when they started to put the jumps in. It just enhanced it. It was good with those extra jumps. And, and I, like you, watched the 250 Grand Prix in 82 or whenever it was. And I stood on those routes and watched them with my jaw on the floor. First time we saw Danny Laporte or whatever, skip top of them. I was, oh my God, it was very impressive. Uh, but the, it's just like exactly what you're saying. Oh, which made it better. We'll, we'll just keep improving it by adding more jumps and I do think it's ripped the backside out of the place. But think of those whoops as an example. They haven't got rid of them. They haven't built built a massive jump there. They're just not as good as they used to be. So either the digger driver doesn't know what he's doing or someone's forgotten how they used to be. You know, but it wouldn't it wouldn't cost any more to get them right, to put them back to how they were so that somebody can can skim through there. And it and it could be just as exciting as it used to be. That's that sandpit. I remember the first time that same GP would have been eighty two or something, two fifty GP. Seeing Pete Matthew jump off the sandpit. I've never seen anybody jump off something the height of a house before. Um, so it, it's a shame that it, it's. I don't understand it. Is it intentional, or is it that they just don't care, or is it that that mm. they just they don't know the digger driver doesn't know and whoever's instructing the digger driver he doesn't know either but it could be so much better all tracks could be so much better you know even the going back to the gps you know people rave about the fact that majora is back on the circuit even majora could be better every track could be improved and, and there's no reason why you can't have great passing opportunities in every corner it's all down to the shape of the corner where you put the posts it's simple, it wouldn't mm. cost anything. No, and improve the show. And ultimately, yeah. that's currently what everybody, the promoters, all about the show. So surely you would improve it if you could. I, it seems like it's an easy win that's ignored. They, they, they just, they just seem to have turned it into a sort of an outdoor supercross mostly, don't they? Yeah, and nobody likes that. And, and I don't... No. I don't understand that. Like I said before, it's like somebody thought jumps are exciting. So 25 jumps is 25 times more exciting. And if you make them twice as big, that's going to be twice as exciting. But, but it isn't. I think the, the primary goal should be to create passing opportunities, to, to create an exciting race uh, in, in hand with safety. Safety should be up there as well. Um, mm. and, and jumps, I'm not saying get rid of all jumps. Jumps are like makeup. On a, on a lady, the right amount can, um, you know, can improve somebody too much, can make it worse. Um, I think tracks are too fast as well. Tracks are a lot faster than they used to be. Corners are a lot faster. Well, the riders are so fast at cornering now, aren't they? The speed that a modern rider carries in a, a corner means that, that surely the organisers have to put the limit on it because they are incredibly fast through the corners, aren't they? I'm going to disagree with you there. It's not the riders that are fast through the corners. It's the corners are faster. Right. Bikes, the bike can only turn until you get the handlebars in the ground. Um, yeah. yeah the, bikes turning, the bikes aren't turning any faster. So the corners are, are bigger. The corners are, are longer radius. Right. Radius. You look at videos from, from back in the day and they were tight, twisty corners. 
and it's not that every corner is a big sweeping 180 um, and you are going faster through it and that means that that doesn't the fact that it's fast doesn't help the overtaking because you can't change direction as quickly at 30 miles an hour as you can at 15 miles an hour you know the slower you are the, the tighter you can turn if you've got a long sweeping corner you, you can't change direction and the fact that those corners are all 180s where the, where's the different line in a 180 there isn't you, you just either got to follow the, the ropes on the inside or or a few yards out from that or on the outside it's just one all the lines are the same in a 180 mm. sweeper and so many corners are like that whereas back in the day well if you get if you think of a 180 sweeper and you just chop it off on the inside so it becomes two 90s then you've got a choice of lines you can go round it in a big 180 or you can square it off go across square it off just by moving a couple of posts you've created different opportunities there for, for different passing lines mm -hmm. so i don't think they, they they either don't care or they don't know or i don't know uh, so yeah. we'll sure. move on from the tracks i know simon which was going to be a question before Simon was going to appear on it. I uh, wanted you to ask you about, Simon's a massive Kawasaki fan, by the way. He has a little <laughs> collection of them. And he wanted to ask you a difference between the SR and the KX. So where you go, Simon? Yeah, well, obviously in, in, in 85, you rode the standard KX, but in 86, you then got the 85 SR. Right. And you rode that, most of the season, but in America and Canada, was it you had to actually ride a, back onto a, a production bike? That's right, yeah. And how did that compare? I mean, obviously, reading reading all of the, uh, the the various things, the works riders used to get the bikes set up and sort of tailored around them. You you probably didn't get that benefit in 80, 86. You, you you were given a works bike, so it wasn't set up perfectly for you. Well, how did it compare to the production KX? Not massively different. So, uh, it just, were there any it, benefits to it? Yeah, the, the power, you know, when I first rode that bike, it was the first time I'd ever ridden a works bike of any sort. And so I was expecting it to be blinding fast. Um, you know, like the difference between stepping off a 125 onto a 250. But it, mm. it wasn't, it felt, it felt unimpressed, no, not unimpressive. Um, it was, it was just efficient. It was, it was smooth. You know, the, the difference on the factory 500 that I found, and I rode a few of them, um, mostly after I finished racing, tested Kurt's bike and a couple of times, and I rode Thorpe's bike once, um, and Malin's 500, that perimeter frame one. And where they really scored is in the, the, the tractability of the engine. The, the, the power was, was smoother. So coming out of the corner, it didn't, it didn't wheelie, it didn't slip out, it just drove. Mm. And so it, it, it wasn't so much that you felt it was faster coming out of the corner, it just it wasn't losing time like a production bike might. A production bike might just slide out a little bit, it might spin the, the wheel. Um, it just, just hooked up and drove. So a good works bike would, would make you faster without you really doing anything different, without you really having to ride any faster, because it, it just it gained those tenths of a second coming out of the corner um, rather than losing them. Uh, the forks are a little bit better on it. Um, the, the, it turned quite well. But, you know, not not massively different, but it, it was those those small things. Just actually, I mentioned Paul Malin's bike. That would have been probably the last factory five hundred I rode. This was the one that thought he didn't want to ride. The that one, on, yeah. That one. So I understand. I mean, I don't really understand the, the technical side of it, but it almost felt like it. It the clutch was slipping intentionally, and when he came out the corner. Imagine if, if you know if, if you're doing a third gear start and you're letting that clutch out smoothly. It was like the bike was doing that on its own coming out the corners, and it wasn't because the clutch was knackered and it was too slippy. It had just got a certain amount of give in the clutch. It wasn't it wasn't solid. That's how it felt. So that when you rolled when you open the throttle on, it 
it didn't slide, it just hooked up, it just went. And so it's, it's gaining time coming out the corners without you actually doing anything any different. You go around the corner, same speed as the guy next to you, but this bike wouldn't, would get some more traction coming out of the corner and so it would propel you down the track quicker. Okay, so it was, le it was less aggressive than his, his power delivery. It was, it was less aggressive, it was, it was easier to ride. Uh, I've no idea whether the, it, it actually made more horsepower, probably had more, more mid-range horsepower. But it was, uh, you know, all the good work spikes that I rode were good because they were well set up and, and they, they were efficient. They worked efficiently. They didn't jump out of your hands. Um, and they would make any, any bike, uh, sorry, any rider faster, really. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we, we've got to ask you, which was the best one? What the best works by? Yeah, Kurtz. Right. He's, he's yeah. KTM. Yeah. 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 They're all good. I mean, Thorpe is. I only rode Thorpe is for 10, 15 minutes on a sand track, and I was a bit scared of breaking it. But but that was Thorpe is was um, the power was was quite remarkable on that because it it seemed that whatever revs you were at. It produced the same amount of forward thrust. So if you're in a if you're in a low gear on a production bike, you're in second gear and you open the spot with bah, it's it's jumping out your hand. Thorpe wasn't like that. Rather like a modern day four stroke, if, if you guys have ridden a modern day four stroke. Yeah. Very similar power delivery in that they, it's not wasn't so snappy at, at high revs in a low gear. Uh, but in a high gear, at lower revs, it seemed to pull just the same amount. Um, but Kurt's bike was was like that as well, but Kurt's was just Everything about it just worked so well. The forks were brilliant. I rode his bike at Chippenham, which was a sand track, and then the next year, or the year before, I rode it at Ellsworth. And I remember thinking, I don't have to pick lines to avoid the bumps coming to corners. He had conventional Marsaki forks, and they were just brilliant. And those sharp, square edge bumps coming to corners, just, just ride through them. It's like they're not there. The brakes worked well, the power was good, and everything about Kurt's bike was just so well set up. So, was that Thorpe's Kawasaki you were talking about? Uh, did you ever get to ride any of his 85, no. 86 HRCs? The one I'm, I've just mentioned, that was his 85 Honda. Right, which, okay. The, the day that I went, no, it was at Camberley. I was there practicing one day. I can't remember which day it was. I did go to Camberley practicing on the 125 just before the motocross donations. It may have been that day, but anyway, I did 10 minutes. There was nobody else there, and he said, do you want to have a go on it? So I did 10 minutes on Thorpe's Honda. Uh, but I rode Malin's Kawasaki, which was Thorpe's Kawasaki. So that was the perimeter frame, yeah. factory 500, that David yeah. didn't, and then they gave to Paul. Well, you, you've just answered one of my questions here, because I was going to ask you, did you ever ride one of the 85, 86 HRCs? I, I rode the 85, yeah. didn't ride the 86, but yeah. that Dave yeah. reckons that the, the most powerful one was the 85, engine-wise. Yeah. But that, that was the only one I, I, of his I rode. Yeah, and, and did, did, did that spoil you for getting back on the production stuff afterwards? Uh, not really. I remember Roger Harvey telling me once that he, he never rode a works bike because he didn't want to because then he'd be so disappointed with the production bike that he had had to race. But no, I never I never thought of it like that. Mm. You know, when I rode that factory bike in 86, when I went back to Kawasaki in 88, it was going to be on a production bike. And I didn't think I'm at a big disadvantage here. In 87, when I went to Honda, that was on a production bike. I didn't think I was disadvantage and particularly on a 500 there's there's enough power there you know, maybe on a 125 you'd, you'd be thinking well i'm going to be at a big disadvantage if i haven't got a work bike but on a 500 there's always enough power there and there's certain things you can do to to smooth it out a little bit yeah uh, so, so you know, but, look, but looking back now i probably think yeah, it, it, it is an advantage to have had a works bike. And if, if I'd have had the same equipment as, as thought back then, I'm sure I would have done a bit, a bit better than I did. Yeah. So out uh, of the bikes that you rode, that you raced, not what you rode, but what was your what was your favourite model or what was your favourite brand? You know, Favourite brand would be Honda because they, they were just more reliable. The Honda were easier to work with than uh, Alec and Kawasaki. Yeah. <laughs> 
that's discussed in some detail in the, in the book. You know, Honda UK were a, a, a dream to to work with, um, and yeah, I mean, Hondas were were more reliable. You know, the Kawasaki's that I had had a lot of problems with. I mean, even that works bike, the clutch didn't work on it. Um, you know, we didn't get any much support. You know, we, we the suspension, we didn't have anybody. We couldn't change the suspension. We didn't have any factory Kayaba technicians there working on our suspension. I was given that bike and just told to ride it. And yeah. the, the forks were just what the forks were. So I didn't know whether they were set up for sand or hard pack or whatever. Just had to race them. And then half of the season, I asked to switch to white power forks so that I, I would be able to use suspension where I've got a bit of backup. And I managed it to use those for one race. And then Kawasaki Japan got wind of it and they put a stop to it. Um, but we had problems with the clutch on that works bike. We had a problem with the clutch on the 88 production bike. The clutch plates off the start, the clutch would just would just heat up. As you let the, the clutch out, the plates would get really hot instantly and expand. And by expanding, they would engage the clutch all the time forward. So um, unless the ground was soft and you could get the back tire spinning, you know, I like to start in third gear sometimes. There's no way I could do a third gear start in the Kawasaki. But you'd have to clip, slip the clutch for you know, 15 yards off, off the gate. Well, what would happen with the Kawasaki is, as soon as you go over the gate, the, the clutch plates expanded and it would engage and, and the thing would loop out. And you couldn't then disengage the clutch, no matter how far in you pulled it, <laughs> it wouldn't disengage. Right. Exciting start to every race. Yeah. <laughs> and I was told that it was, it was me. I was right. told nobody else has complained about it. it it's, you know, okay. must right. be me. So if I can now, I'm just going to move on to a few members' questions, a few questions that we've had fired at us. Um, uh, we'll just flow through them, get them out of the way, because I want to then have a chat about the book. I'm interested about the book, being a future well, owner of one. Just before you do that, can we have that break that we talked about for two minutes? Of course we can. <laughs> we'll be back in a second. You just press pause. <laughs> on it. Right, so uh, uh, we've got some uh, questions from the members. Uh, first one is from uh, Alan Woods, age 10, from Wigan. Uh, Simon, <laughs> would you care to answer it? Uh, ask it, not answer it. Rob, you answer it. Uh, Rob, did you keep any bikes or much memorabilia from your GP days? Bikes, no. I mean, my, my bikes all belong to Honda. So at the end of 1990, they were all um, tidied them up and I took them took them back um, and at that point you know when I stopped racing I kind of thought that's it I'm done with it now why would I need a bike you know I, I, I'd exhausted my I thought my enthusiasm for riding so now I didn't have a bike but it didn't take long I went straight into doing test riding for dirt bike riders so I still got to ride so that, was, that weaned me off it slowly and then after a few years I did end up buying a bike because there's nothing worse than getting the urge to go out riding and you haven't got a bike in the garage. So I still have a, have a, a I've got a modern KTM and I do have a 500 Honda, not one of mine. Um, but I've ridden for, for quite some time. Um, memorabilia. Um, no, most of my riding gear all got given to fans. Um, I still get asked today. I get messages today on Facebook. You've got any riding shirts? And I say, it was like 30 years ago. How many did you think I had? Um, I think I did, I kept a couple of sets of kit, which uh, I won't part with, um, you know, those are family heirlooms. I kept a, a few of my bigger trophies, you know, international trophies and that sort of thing. All the schoolboy trophies have long since gone to the tip, unfortunately. Um, and uh, another little, little things. In fact, if you've got, just pause for don't pause it, but just give me 10 seconds. <laughs> we'll be back. Oh, we've just got time for an advert. <laughs> no, no advert, I'm back. <clears throat> That's my favourite bit of memorabilia. Ah. Do you know what that is? Uh, no. <laughs> it's a cap, right? You, you've, we've all heard of football players being capped for England, and I yeah. never knew what that meant. If you ride for your country, you get a cap. Yeah. It, it is a, a ceremonial velvet cap. It says motocross, Des Nations, Des Nations, 
West Germany 1985. And, and so some, some months after that race, I got presented with that. So I'm, I'm very proud of that because not many people have um, a cap for uh, performance. Of yeah. um, Absolutely not. And that, that, that I have to say, I, I've read the little bits about that story, which we'll get to in a second. And it's a fantastic story. But being a member of the MX, uh, uh, the Nations team, must have been real, uh, a real pride moment for you. Uh, yes, it was, because I, I never thought it would happen, and it was a bit of a fluke that I that I got in there anyway, but I wasn't going to let the opportunity slip by. Um, yeah, and that's, that's detailed in your book. Uh, but, but yeah, I'm, I'm very proud of that, because not many people get the opportunity to, to do that. Uh, and, and even though it, I was fortunate in that the, the opportunity got presented because of some weird circumstances um, but I absolutely vindicated my selection because I rode really well that day and I don't think anybody would have done a, a better job. No, I, I tend to agree and the, uh, the, there was obviously some uh, uh, politics going on with the manufacturers and the ACU at that point. Was it a manufacturer, a single manufacturer that has an issue or was no. it it was, it was very simple and, and quite the beggar's belief that it arose in the first place. And it was purely that the, the ACU scheduled a one two five and two fifty British Championship on the same day as the Nations. Oh. Uh, you know, back then the one two fives and two fifties ran together, and then you got the Open Class, which was the main British Championship. But yeah. one two five and two fifties that, that they ran eight rounds or whatever, and one of those rounds was scheduled on the same day as the Motocross to Nations. And so the the manufacturers had said to the ACU like 12, 18 months before when the calendar came out, you know, that's not going to work because you're going to need a 125 and a 250 rider and, and our sponsored riders are going to be tied up with the national championship because that's what they're paid to do. And so this was the, that was the gist of the, the situation and it just became an impasse. And so as the time drew nearer, the, the manufacturers said, you need to move that date. And the ACU said, we're not moving that date. And so the manufacturers said, well, you're not going to have any of our riders because we, we want to contest that national championship. That's our number one priority, not the motocross to nations. Um, and neither side gave ground. So all the manufacturers, or the UK importers, I should say, they, they all stuck together and agreed not to, not to break ranks. Um, but the ACU didn't budge either. And so as far as I'm aware, that 125 and 250 championship took place on the same day as the nations. And so that right. meant that all the good 125 and 250 guys were, were tied up having to contest that national championship. Right. Um, and so the ACU then wanted to put a team in for the nations, but the manufacturer said, well, you can't have our riders. So it was a, it was a deadlock for a while. Uh, Thorpe was number one choice on 500, obviously. He just won his first world championship. Kurt Nicola agreed to drop down to a 250. But they had no one two five rider till literally like it was ten days before the event. No one two five rider. So I must have said to somebody, and I don't remember who it was or when or, or where, but I must have said I'd ride the one two five. And then I got a call out of the blue from Albert Carter, the ACU team manager, that said I, somebody tells me you'd ride a one two five, and I said yeah. <clears throat> and he said okay, you're in the team. And it was just like that. Um, you know, I wouldn't have got the chance otherwise because I was a 500 guy so as I talk about in the book because I, of course I, I got the call to be on the team and then I went to Alec Wright because I just switched to Kawasaki part way through 1985 I started to get some help from Kawasaki UK so I went to Alec and said brilliant news I'm on the team and Alec said I can't give you a bike he said, firstly, because I don't have any 125s, it's, it's September, late August, and all the bikes are sold out, and we haven't got any new 86s in yet. And even if I did have a bike, I can't do it because we're in dispute with the ACU over this date clash, and I'm not going to break ranks with Honda, Yamaha, and Suzuki, and so I can't help you. So I was on the team, and I had no bike, so I ended up having to buy a second hand one off the school board. Yeah. Back to the classified ads like the Suzuki K10. <laughs> exactly, yeah. But, you know, at that point where I thought, oh, 
where am I going to get a bike from? What am I going to do? I thought, this is my one and only opportunity to ride the motocross to nations because I was committed to, the, to riding a 500 now. That's where I started to come good. <coughs> I was, wasn't going to be switching down to 125 GPs. I was a 500 guy at that point. And so the chances of me ever getting selected for Britain in the future would mean outperforming Thorpe, outperforming Nickel. And at the point I was chosen, I'd only just scored my first points in 500 GPs. You know, I, I was the 39th ranked rider in the 500 class. You know, ahead of me in the championship with tons of people, Thorpe, Nickel, um, Watson, Watley, Spence, well, Spence is Irish, but you know, a whole bunch of riders. So the chance of me, me ever getting picked on a 500 was zero. Yeah. And so that's why I thought, I'm not going to let these people ruin my chance. So sod it, I'll go and buy my own bike. Yeah. I, I, I have to say, after reading that story, why the hell didn't you go and do the one two fives the following year at the two fifties? Because I think you miss your I think you miss your opportunity there. People asked me that you know at the time because I'd ridden well on that one two five, but I didn't like riding one two fives. Um, the main British Championship was was an open class. The reason that I concentrated on five hundred anyway was because I'd spent three years trying to get out of the support class and then when i got in the top 35 my first year i didn't do anything special for this 2030. in four years i've just been languishing not really going anywhere and part of the problem was that i got a 250 and a 500 and the 500s were just difficult to ride right. i hated them um and but in a, if you ride in an open class race on a 250 you're starting at a disadvantage yeah. you know, i could never get a good start on a 250. you know you look at you know, back in those years, Watley and Herring and those guys, you know, they were on works 250s and they were struggling with the British Championship. You know, they weren't winning races. You know, we were beating, well, I was beating Herring and Watley at, the, at that point because I was on a 500. So I decided for 1985 that if I want to do any well in the, any good in the British Championship, I need to learn how to ride a 500 properly. And the only way to do that is to remove the easy option of having a 250. So I'd already decided my my path career path was down the 500 line um and once never liked one two fives really that must have been like getting on a moped after a 500 it was yeah it was difficult i was never in the right gear that was the problem that i had you know and i'd not ridden a one two five for i don't know four or five years i practiced on it once beforehand and was just in the wrong gear at the wrong time and it, you'd think that well you know you're a professional rider you should be able to to know what it's the right gear but it takes a while to get used to a bike yeah you know some riders change brands and it, it takes them a year to 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 get to know that bike and yeah. i jumped off at 500 onto a 125 and, and yeah it, 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 i just started to get it together as we went to the races on the sunday i all day saturday to practice on it at Bangor. and then by the third race i was going good on it yeah, well you don't you don't want to adapt that quick in that sort of talent. Uh, yeah, I think it's an understatement to say you were going well on it. You were bleeding, yeah. flying, boy. <laughs> there were some good guys. There were some good guys in that one two five class. You know, the, in front of me was Lachine, Strybos, Vekkonen, Maddy, Rado Maddy, yeah. and Dietmar Lacker. Uh, so I finished sixth overall behind those guys. So that was the, the first three in the one two five world championship. And the American Jam, you know, all on factory bikes. Yeah. Um, but what was most interesting is because that that year it was three classes combined, all in one race. So sixty three guys on the line, twenty one teams, sixty three riders. So you know, in the one race I finished, I can't remember fourteenth or something in, in the actual race, fourteenth in the race, maybe fifth, one two five in the last race. But I was in front of a ton of five hundreds. You know, it wasn't a that wasn't 14th out of the 125s. That was 14th. So there were, you know, however many, 40 odd 250s and 500s behind me, which is yeah. nice to, to see. And I've got pictures in my book, actually. Of, uh, one picture, there's uh, Guy Van Giesigem behind me. He's on a 125. And then Yucca Sintony. Because we all remember Yucca Sintony. He was on a 500. And there I am on a 125 in front of him. Yeah, and he was no slouch, Yucca Sintony. Yeah. yeah. I think you can say you earned that cap. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree with that. 
Um, so I'll give you the next question is from Gary Hurst. Who was the biggest character you raced with and why? <clears throat> biggest character? There were lots of characters, you know, lots of riders in the GPs and it was just a bunch of guys. And you, you, could, you could throw your net over a bunch of guys in your local town or at your pub or whatever and you get all sorts of different types of people. It was no different in motocross racing. You know, some guys were cool, some guys were funny, some guys were a bit irritating. Um, uh, there were some characters. Jared Smith was a character. I'm sure you probably expected me to say that. I like Jared. Um, he was a funny guy. Uh, he he got this image that you know he was this hard northerner, but he's pussycat really. <laughs> yeah. Good guy to race against. You know, he, even though he was this this hard yeah. man, you, you you knew. You know, he rode fair. He rode hard, but but fair. Whereas someone like Amsty, you, you never knew what he was going to do on the track. Um, but Russ Jarman, he, he was a character, and all of his mates were characters. He, he would, he did a few GPs, did Russ. Um, but he had this gang of friends from down Surrey Way, and they all had nicknames. I mean, there's a few of them on Facebook. Um, Aid the Shades, Mooey. I don't know what these guys' real names are. Maverick was another one, you know. Who knows what their their real names were, but they would they would go with him to the races and they were just a funny, a funny group. And I went skiing with them as well. They went on a skiing trip. Um, and it was just brilliant fun going skiing right. with these guys. <laughs> Simon Maddox, you remember that name? Yes. Simon Maddox, he was from I know, I know Mad Dog very, very well from Mad uh, Dog. Yeah. Mad Dog went skiing with us one year and he he had no idea what he was doing. He had no idea. He couldn't ski. I couldn't ski when I first went with these guys. I was a complete beginner. Um, and they gave me 30 seconds on a beginner slope and then took me straight to the top of the mountain and just pretty much pushed me off the edge. And that, that was how I learned to ski because it was the only way I was going to get down. And Simon Maddox was the same, but, but he, he basically couldn't do it. But he was just going flat out everywhere with no idea how to ski. He crashed his brains out, that guy. That's how he used to ride. That's yeah. exactly, exactly how I used to ride. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, I've not seen Simon for a long, long time. Uh, and, and funny enough, I, I, I was t speaking to somebody the, the other day who'd just seen him and uh, I, I, I just missed him. So, uh, yeah, no, we used to be good friends when we were kids. Um, right, so that kind of covers that. I want to move on to the book now, if that's okay. I'm, mindful, yeah. I'm, I'm keeping you a long time. Um, I've got all night. <laughs> Simon. I've got all night and I've still got half pipe left. Look at that. Oh, we're all right. Crack on. Um, and we can pause it again. <laughs> right. right. You're going to move on to the book now. Um, where did the idea for the book, oh, where did the idea to, to write the book come from then, Rob? Obviously, you had all the, uh, all of it in your head, but what inspired you to, to, to put it to paper? I, I thought about doing a book after I quit racing, very briefly, but I, I, I didn't really know what it would be about. It sounds a strange thing to say, but I didn't know what it would be about. I thought it'd be quite cool to do a book, but you know, what would it be, riding tips or, I don't know, couldn't think of an angle. And then, and so that was, that idea was gone. And then, you know, in the intervening 30 years, um, the internet came along um, and you, you realize that there's a lot of people interested in that era and I would post stuff on Facebook and you know you, you realize there's just a lot of affection for that that time in motocross and people like the pictures and I started to write little things if someone would post a picture and I'd say well I remember a story about that and I'd write some of it and people would seem to like reading that um, and I always knew there was a lot of interesting things that happened in my career, but I never really, you know, I'm not the sort of person to, to, to pin somebody down and talk about the cell phone night about the, about the motocross. But it became apparent that people were interested in this, this stuff. Uh, I met a local guy, a friend, Andy James. He was a, a fan back in the 80s. Um, 
And every time he saw me, he would ask me stuff. And he'd, he'd be fascinated by the smallest detail. So, but I still never thought about doing the book. And then, what would it be? Two years ago now, a friend of mine, Steve Carty, asked me on Facebook to write something about how we prepare to go to overseas races. And the only overseas races I did was Canada and Carlsbad 86. Um, and I put it off. I thought, how am I going to write about it? Um, I thought he's, he's going to want to know, you know, how, what did we take with us or something like that? You know, what, what parts did we take? And that, that's, that's a bit boring. But I thought, I, I need to do this. So one night I sat down with my iPad, started to write something out, started to think about it. And I remembered what happened in the lead up to that. And the first thing was that despite me being at that point about eighth in the world championship, Alec Wright with Kawasaki told me, if I wanted to go to Canada and Carlsbad, I'd have to pay for it all myself. Um, ship my own practice bike out to Canada at my expense and so on. That was the first thing. Um, and I also remembered that 10 days before I was due to go to Canada, I ended up walking through a plate glass window in a supermarket by accident. Um, which people knew about at the time, but people didn't realise how serious it was. Um, I, I properly cut my arm and cut my artery and, and basically bled to death on the floor of Tesco's in Tewkesbury. Um, and as I, as I started to, to think about these things, I just thought, nobody knows this. So I, I can't write that on a Facebook post. It's, it's a waste. You know, this is this is interesting stuff, and there's lots of other interesting stuff that, that happened. And I thought this really needs to be in a book. I remember those exact words as I was just jotting some notes down for this story for, for Steve. I remember thinking this needs to be in a book, and that was that was how the idea came. And then I put the feelers out on Facebook that night and said, you know, what does everybody think about a book? And I had hundreds and hundreds of people say absolutely. I still didn't really know what it was going to be about. I just thought, well, I've got a lot of interesting stuff to, to tell. You know, there's the Tesco's window story. There's the story about having to pay my, uh, to send my bikes to Canada. There's the motocross donation story. There's, there's lots of other things that, that were all interesting stories, but how do you put them into a book? In, in, in what order do you put them? Um, so I started to think of all the interesting things, all of the subject matter that I could to put down in a book. And it was all over the place, all good stuff, fine on a Facebook, on a standalone Facebook post, but it didn't really make any sense in a book format. And then I thought, oh, well, I need to do this in a, in a chronological order. So it, it sort of morphed into an autobiography. I didn't set out to do an autobiography. It's not the story of my life. It's the story of my motocross career. It, it starts with my chance encounter with the Imps motorcycle display team. It starts, you know, the day one of me becoming interested in motorcycles and it, and it finishes at the day I retired. So it's, it's, it's a biography of my motocross career. But that was the only way I could categorize and, and put down in, a, in a, an order that made sense. All of these interesting little stories and, and anecdotes. And it kind of expanded from there. And there are some chapters, there are some years that there was so much interesting stuff going on that I had to split that year up into three separate chapters. There are other things like, you know, how we used to fiddle with ferry tickets going to, going to Europe that, that didn't fit into a, a particular year. And so there are, there are standalone chapters that, that cover, you know, life on the road. So that, that, you know, how we used to do the ferry tickets is in the life on the road chapter. And there's another chapter on French internationals because they, they covered loads of different years. So I've got a standalone chapter about French internationals. I've got a standalone chapter on what the life of a professional motocross rider was like. You know, the, the fans saw us as professional riders. They didn't really know what we did all the time. What did we do in the week? You know, how did we get to the races? What did we do in between? And when when you, you go and watch it in the morning, you leave on the Sunday night, what do the riders do after that? We didn't go home. We cleaned up and then had to find somewhere to park up in a lay-by somewhere, you know, for the next five days before we went to the next race. And all of these sort of things that us as riders, that's just what we did. But the, the, the public at large didn't really know about that and know how that worked. And so the, the book kind of built up into, a, into, into what it is today, which is something I'm really, really 
proud of and I, I, I think it's it's a really interesting piece of work. Mm -hmm. Good. Now this might reflect my personality more than anything else. Um, I, I would spend days messing about working out what picture to put on the cover. Um, would, was it something that you kind of went, that's my favourite picture, we're having it, boof, it's done. Or, or did you have that same, that same time? No, I, to work I, it? I did, yeah, right from the, uh, an early stage, I thought, I'm going to have to get a cover shot sorted. Um, I had had that photo, <laughs> that photo, if you can see that, that head and shoulders. That's a Jack Bernicle shot from Namur. And he'd sent that to me some years ago. And it was a, it was a, a nice shot. I liked it. Um, the first thing you need to consider, of course, it's got to be portrait format. Mm. You know, I've got some great shots, but a, a lot of them are a landscape. The landscape isn't going to work on, a, on the cover of a book. So it needed to be a portrait shot. And I always liked that shot because it, you know, motocross is a tough sport. And racing in the, in the 500 GPs was was tough and you know I think it's like well, it's not very good is it it was that was taken obviously after a race I've just done 45 minutes at Namur I've got dirt all over, over my face snot all over my face I've got a towel in my hand um, you know and you're just exhausted and, and I think that picture just just captured how tough it was you know the the the, the the fitness, the stamina, the, the, the grit. Um, you know, and I hadn't won that race. Uh, I, I, I can't remember what my results were in 86. I'd have to look them up. But um, I just think it, it encapsulated a lot of what I was trying to convey in the book, that it was a, it was a tough, gnarly sport. Um, and it was portrait, it fitted well. Um, and the designer I worked with, he gave me a little help with the... With the he came up with the, the, the look and the feel and the design of the, the book. Uh, he liked that one. Um, we actually went down to went to visit this guy. We went to a news agent to look at other books, and we found a couple of other books that had that kind of black cover with the, you know, with it with it faded out with that vignette around it, and, uh, and that's that's what we came up with. And, and I think it, it works well, probably better than I, I don't have any action shots that would have worked as well as that. I think it's a cracking shot and exactly it puts that story that you were, you were trying to portray as well, that grit. Yeah, yeah I, I, I thought it was a very good shot, but that's probably and, what and made me think. I bet he's laboured hard on that. But Bernicle said right at the beginning, I asked him about it, he said, it's really that one. You know, it's just, he said that straight away. And it's got the camel bib, you know, so straight away the camel bib and that helmet, it dates it to that era as well. Yeah. You know, that, that that camel sponsorship is 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 yeah. inextricably linked, isn't it, with that, that era in Absolutely. Grand Prix. So it's yeah. it's got everything that you you need really. Yeah, yeah, no. And it's like what's your favourite picture? Have you got a favourite picture? Perhaps one your dad did or that or whatever, I don't know. Difficult to pick a favourite. That's like saying which is your favourite of your three daughters <laughs> um, you know there's a lot of great pictures in there there's some some stunning photos um, you know i got a photo of the first time i ever rode, rode a motocross bike you know it's a grainy black and white one but that means a lot to me uh, my dad was a photographer himself he, he took one of my very first race start you know so to have those two photos is amazing from a personal level um the the, the start line shots at but no more. I was really thrilled that I was able to get those because you see lots of first corner shots, but you don't see many of the of the start line shots. Um, if I can, can find one, um, you know that's that sort of shot. If you can see that, you know yeah. with the rise actually on the line and the, and the citadel behind. Um, so I, I asked Jack specifically for that, and Jack came up with one and uh, Ray Archie came up with one as, as well so I like those I like the bar, bar drag picture at the back because that's just an awesome shot even though it wasn't done when I was racing that was on a bike test but so there's, there's lots of cool pictures in there I think if I had to pick a favorite it's um it's the one on the opening to the Namor chapter which is a, a photo of Kurt Nickel not myself Kurt Nickel going past the the cafe of Namor 
Um, and you, you need to get a book and, and study that photo. I had to write an entire page of caption for that photo because it's just such a stunning shot because of the, of the crowd. The, the number of people there and, and what the crowd are doing. There's one guy giving the middle finger to Nichols, another guy giving the middle finger to Joe Bay that's just about to come into shot. You've got Belgian fans, British fans, there's Union Jacks, you know, everybody's having a great time. It, it, it just, just a, a fantastic shot. It's a pity it's not me in it though. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've stood down there many times in that position. Yeah, it's a, a great. I mean, I, I haven't stood down there, um, but you know, I love racing there and I can imagine it would be brilliant. And, you know, and I guess there was no trouble there, even though you've got, you know, hardcore Belgian supporters and British supporters, each abusing, you know, the other rider, the rival to whoever they're supporting. But it doesn't look like anybody's fighting down there. No, it, it was always sort of, um, you know, it, it, was, it was a lot of, lot of Brits there, a lot, a lot of Belgians there, but it, it was always good banter between the two if you yeah. understood each other it was uh, it was all about the racing it was never trouble yeah no but you're showing those pictures you just made me think of something i i've said and i hope you don't mind me saying this I, i've seen a few posts on the internet saying 40 quid ah, it's 40 quid for a book now i have a fair idea because i do stuff with printing and what have you uh, and you've just shown us some photographs in no time at all but would you care to just expand on why it's 40 quid? And, and I just... will do, yeah, because it's a, uh, yeah, you're not the first person to have mentioned it. There's a few reasons. Um, here's a couple of motocross books. Good books, Kurt's book, Brian's book. That's the first point. Yeah. So it's 408 pages in my book. It's, so basically it's two books. It's twice the size of, uh, uh, of most books. So that's, the, that's one of the, the reasons. Um, we're not printing 100,000 of these. It's motocross. It's, it's, it's not a mainstream uh, publication. So the economies of scale are there. But by far the, the, the biggest factor is Richard Hammond's autobiography. 20 quid to you. And this is a, a typical autobiography. So Richard Hammond's mostly black and white printed on toilet paper. If you only print in black and white, then you, you don't need a high quality paper. And as people will be familiar, what you get is you get sections of color pictures. And the color pictures, very nice Richard pictures, and they're printed on glossy art paper, which four color printing, full color, needs to be. And that's what most books are. They're either all black and white, and you've got sections in there. You can always, always see the sections. Um, and Richard's actually got a couple of different sections. In my book, is one entire colour section. Every page is printed on super duper glossy paper, four colour all the way through. So there's none of the, the toilet paper with just one colour print. The whole thing is four colour printed. And by, that's by far the biggest factor uh, to the cost. But it is one, it is 408 pages of colour photo section. Um, so that's why it costs a lot of money uh, but you know when I started writing this and it's also it's lifo printed it's properly printed it's not a digital print it's proper book printing um, and it, that really needs much larger quantities to get the economy of scale <coughs> but when I started this project I started writing it <coughs> did all the all the copy in about three months um, and I was really pleased with it. And I didn't give much thought to how I was going to actually produce this thing. Then I got the photos, and Ray Archer has provided most of the photos for this. And some of his stuff is just epic. It took me weeks and weeks and weeks going through Ray's slide. Ray sent me his entire collection of originals from back then. Massive box like this. And it took me literally weeks taking these slides and negatives out, holding them up to the window, and going, wow, look at that. Um, <clears throat> And then I had to scan those, and they, they were just amazing photographs. And then I started putting the artwork together. Um, and it's nicely designed as well. You know, it's not just a book. It's, it's got a nice design to it. Um, lots of double page spreads in there. Nice layout. And I got to a point where I thought, this is the only book I'm ever going to do. I've worked really hard on this. 
I could do in anything that I, I do to try and do the very best job that I possibly can. I mean, why, why would you do anything else? I'm only going to write the one motocross book about my career. And so I've tried to, to get everything as good as it possibly can be. So when it came to the printing, I got quotes for digital printing, which were a lot cheaper. But I just thought I'd never be happy with that. Yeah, I, I don't want to look back at my book in years to come and say, yeah, it was all right, but I, I did cut corners on the printing and I did cut corners on the, the cover. I mean, the cover's got, you can't tell now, but it's got a, like a rubbery, soft feel laminate to it. The logo is in silver foil. Uh, everything about it was just the highest spec I could possibly get. Because I thought, if I don't sell them, then I don't sell them. But, you know, I, I, I want to be able to look back and go, I approached that like I did my motocross career. I, I gave everything I, I could to make that the best that it possibly could be. And that's why the price ends up um, higher than normal. But um, a lot of people have bought them. Yeah. I've got to say about the quality, when I've been reading it, I'm worried about getting dirty hand marks on it. It's that good. It's that, it's one to treasure. <laughs> you know, I'm not saying that because you're there. Even the wife said to me the other day, make sure the dog doesn't get that book. I, I've, um, I've been blown away by the feedback I've got from people that, that have, have bought it. The people I've got no connection with, I don't know. They're sending me emails every day saying, thank you for writing this book. Um, you know, a guy in America bought six of them about a week ago. Brad Lackey bought one the other day. Um, he didn't get given one. Brad Lackey bought one of my books. It's on its way to, to America now. Um, so I'm blown away by the, uh, the, the feedback. And not one person has said, yeah, it was all right, a bit expensive. The only people that have said, 40 quid, how much, is people that haven't seen the book. And if you hold it in your hand, you go, actually, that's pretty good value. You know, it's a big book. It's, you're not going to read it in a night. Um, and I bet that the majority of people will read it more than once as well. That's what people are telling me. Some of them are on their second and third laps. Yeah, well, let's face it, the reviews, uh, and I mean reviews from motocross action all the way to Simon Chamberlain and Alan Woods, <coughs> A, it's made me order one, um, so, and I'm the tightest northerner you'll ever come across, uh, uh, but also, uh, you must be really pleased, and, and ignoring whether anybody else like it, are you happy with the outcome? Absolutely, yes, yeah, I, I uh, and I'm, I'm happy because I did it the way that I did it and I'm happy that that I went with the most expensive specification because even if I never sold any of them I would look at that book and go that's a good book Alice and so you know I didn't do it to make money they're not massively profitable um, but to, to to have that feedback to have people from all around the world I sold this book to 25 different countries it's, it's incredible 25 countries it is. Including places like Brazil, and one went to Oman, and places that you would never think would A, know who the hell I am, B, have even heard, of, you know, how did they even hear my book, and C, they don't speak English. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so to, to have that, to them have those people email me and, and thanking me for writing a book and saying how, how good they think it is, that's, that's the reward for, for me um, that makes it all worthwhile. Brilliant and well done. And and at that point, I'm going to uh, I'm going to thank you. We've been at it quite a long time. Uh, you've been an absolutely fantastic guest, uh, and and genuinely, I've spent half of the time listening and forgetting I should be joining in because uh, yeah, it's been a, a fantastic thing. So thank you very much, Rob Andrews. Um, and, thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks you. for inviting me along. It's. Um, I've enjoyed it. You know, I'll talk about motocross all, all night long. I'm quite happy to, uh, to do yeah, that. You know, it, it's a passion for all of us, isn't it? Yeah, of, of course it is. And hopefully it won't be the last time I catch up with you as well. And thank you for helping, Simon, too. Uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. Um, uh, as you know, we'll be on the uh, Facebook page. If you've got any comments whilst you're watching this as a watch party, will be available and try and answer any questions. If anything we need to get from Rob, I'll contact him afterwards and, uh, and we'll try and answer everything.
Uh, I'll, I'll probably be, I'll join you on that watch party. So if anybody wants to ask something, I'll be I'll be lurking there. Oh, perfect. That's absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you all soon. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Bye now.